once you've been established in business for a while and you work out your routine and how you work with certain types of people and certain customers, then, you know, you might have two, three, five, eight different ways of working with a type of customer. But when you don't have that baseline, it may as well be a thousand different ways because you haven't worked out, you know, what are the common threads. And so missing that version one means that nothing really ever truly sticks in business. Hello and welcome to Marketing Speak. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer. It is my pleasure to have James Brown with us. James is a seasoned business consultant with over 20 years of experience helping organizations implement systems and processes to improve team productivity, efficiency, and overall business performance. James has worked with a diverse range of businesses in various industries, including manufacturing, construction, professional services, and tourism, and has developed a deep understanding of the challenges faced by small businesses. In 2018, James founded BizTech Guru, a consultant business devoted to helping business owners achieve greater time freedom and business success. His approach heavily draws on his expertise in systemology, revolutionary system, and method for systematizing businesses. I recently interviewed uh, the founder of Systemology, David Jennings, and uh, that episode I highly recommend uh, you guys listen to. James has partnered with Systemology to run their group training programs. He's now helped hundreds of people from around the world to implement the simple yet powerful methodology. James's broad industry background and deep understanding of business challenges allows him to offer innovative and effective solutions to help businesses simplify their operations and maximize team ownership. James, it's so great to have you on the show. Great. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to having a chat. Yeah, so let's talk about how you got started in this, how you ended up focusing on the aspect of business as, you know, setting up systems and, and structures, methodologies and that sort of thing. What drew you to that? It was probably that I had been running a business for quite some uh, years myself and I had worked myself out of the business, out of the day-to-day -day of the business and spent a lot of my time doing business development. That was pretty much where I was yeah, spending 90% of my week. And uh, as a result of that, I was just binging business development all the time, but I only had one business to, to test test my knowledge on to learn more about. And I ended up going branching out and doing business coaching just to be able to, I always found that playing with other people's businesses is far more interesting than my own. But the thing is, I realized that the one key thing I, I didn't know was I had successfully systemized my business, but I'd just done it any which way I could find. And I didn't have like a formula for doing it. And uh, that was when I sort of you know, stumbled across systemology. And I, I, I love simplicity, particularly engineering simplicity, like how much, how can you make something really, really simple, do an effective job without any extra effort and any extra complexity. For me, that's what systemology is. It is just a really, really simple method for implementing uh, systems into a business. Mm -hmm. And how did you come across it? Is there some sort of amazing synchronicity or serendipity that brought you to systemology? Very much so. I was having a chat with a friend. Now, for context, I'm a super slow, deliberate, calculated decision maker. Everything is sort of driven like that with me. And I was having a catch up with a friend looking about uh, joint partnerships and things like that between our businesses. And he's like, oh, oh, there's a book you've got to read. Now, for context, at the time, I had just licensed off a whole bunch of coaching resources. So I had this massive library of things that I really needed to go through and understand to see what I could use to, you know, best impart stuff to my, my clients. And he's like, no, 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 you have to go read this book. I'm like, oh, I don't need another book to read. I've got too much on my plate. And he's like, just do it. And he goes, look, tell you what, I'll send you a video. And it was actually a video of Dave Jennings chatting with, uh, with people sort of explaining about systemology and what it might be like to become a systemologist, which is what I am these days. And I'd already known of Dave. I'd never met him before, but he's in similar circles with people that I, um, I hold in very high regard. And I actually downloaded his ebook, um, Authority Content, his last book. And uh, I don't, I don't think I ever read it. It became one of those ebooks that you sort of download and never read, but I was on his email trail and I don't know if you've ever seen an email from Dave, but every single email he writes feels like it's personally to you. And then you find the unsubscribe link further down the bottom. He's amazing at crafting beautiful emails that really speak to, to individuals, even though they might happen to be sent at scale. I was already a little bit of a fanboy of Dave anyway. I went, okay, I'll give this a try. So I found out about the existence of systemology on a Thursday afternoon and me being typically very slow and calculated. I applied on the Friday morning. My application was accepted Friday afternoon. I was interviewed on the Monday morning and I was in the training program at the end of Monday afternoon. So 
that was not like me, but it was just the right groove. And I'd never, ever come across anything as pragmatic as systemology before. And having so many battle scars from doing it very much the wrong way. You know, when I wrote processes for my, for my, I've got a motel. And um, when I wrote processes for that back in the day, I would write a thousand plus word thesis on how to do something such that any idiot could walk in off the street and do it. And I used to use that type of language. You know, I want someone to be able to walk in off the street and do it thinking that was the best thing I could possibly do. And I just learned through seeing what Dave had done with systemology that that's not appropriate. You know, if you're constantly having really high churn and you find yourself hiring complete strangers with zero experience, then maybe you need to take the, you know, the McDonald's model and, you know, create, you know, ridiculously detailed systems and processes. But if you're hiring people that have got sort of maybe some industry knowledge and you need to teach them your way of doing stuff, then, you know, you apply the Pareto principle and you just use the eighty twenty rule to just give them what they need to, you know, excel and do your formula for how you do whatever you do in your business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to ask you uh, for your most important destiny changing book that was not Dave Jennings' book. I think it was probably the eight dimensions of leadership. I can't remember who wrote it, but it's published by Wiley. It is like a disc profile on steroids for as a leadership profile. I actually had an opportunity to, to do the test in a room with maybe 150 other business owners. And there's sort of eight different profiles. You're probably familiar with disc that is four different profiles and you have different areas in each. And with this one, we all got grouped and sat at the table around a whole bunch of other people who were our type of profile. And the crazy thing was that as soon as you did that, you could see exactly who was, so I'm a resolute leader and you could see who were humble leaders and you could see who were, you know, like peacocks and things like that. And it was within, you read a chapter that's on those diametrically opposed to you and then a chapter on yourself and it talks even about your childhood and it's so accurate, even though it's just speaking to effectively an avatar, it really helps you learn what are the things that you can do as a leader that help you truly understand how to become more rounded. And it really speaks to individuals quite well. Oh, well, that is so cool. I'm familiar with DISC, but I'm not familiar with this book. Uh, it looks like it was published by Jeffrey Sugarman or authored by Jeffrey Sugarman, Mark Scullard and Emma Wilhelm. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, very high ratings on, on Amazon, lots of reviews, 227 of them. That's awesome. So if you could describe what a resolute leader is and how that insight has played into your life and your business, I'd love to hear it. Well, it's a number of years since I read the book. A resolute leader, I feel a bit embarrassed about this, but it is so, so true. Often someone who doesn't feel like there's a place for emotions in the workplace. Let's just focus on what we need to do. They know what they know. And they know what they don't know. And I'm very much in that camp. If if I'm if I don't know something, I'll put my hand up. I'll say I don't know it. Let me learn. I'm eager to you know very hungry to learn. But when you know what you know, oh, don't get in your way. And I think it was I think integrative is the diametrically opposed, which is you know collaborating with with the team, even if you may know the answer, just to get that buy-in from the team and get that ownership and to get that different um, perspective as well. You know something that you may not have considered about some the way that things might impact a customer that they've been dealing with or other team members and things like that. So the resolute leader sits in a very, very high D in terms of disc. The funny thing is, is that I found when I had done that test, I went and flicked that test to all the other leaders in my business. Every single other person was a resolute leader. And so one of the downsides is you often surround yourself with very, very similar leadership styles. And whilst that can make quite a lot of cohesion and make you push forward in a very particular direction, it sort of will leave other people behind and because you have a very stamped out leadership style in your business. So learning about uh, these other perspectives and making sure that when I was bringing people up through the ranks that I was looking for diversity in uh, styles and approach to engaging with people, uh, that became quite important over the years. Interesting. So what have you done to kind of up level in, in recent times? I, I know you got great insight years ago from doing the DISC assessment and reading the book and everything. There are so many assessments out there. There are so many ways that we can look inside and really self-examine. So what, what have you done recently? In terms of what I've done recently, there's probably a couple of things is I, I did read Attraction recently, recently, and that was particularly helpful 
in probably simplifying how I do things in business. But the thing is, I'm actually not much of a book guy. I'm very much a give me a YouTube summary that's sort of 20 or 30 minutes long. And I'd much rather look at that. And I think one of the things I, I looked into most recently was Atomic Habits. And that's actually a lot of elements from Atomic Habits we've woven in through um, one of the programs I run with Systemology. Because I found with systemizing a business, it's not this one great big, you know, big effort. It's more so about building the muscle and building the habits such that your business can slowly by slowly get systemized over time. And ideally without, you know, the business owner or leadership being involved too much. Atomic habits for me, I actually, this is me being, uh, me using this, I'll watch YouTube for a quick um, summary rather than read the actual book. I actually made a mistake with interpreting one of the models because I was just sort of skim reading it, listening to it at three times in the background. And I actually sort of came up with my own iteration on typically, um, are you familiar with atomic, atomic habits at all? Yep. Yep, I am. <laughs> uh, ironically or serendipitously, I just had a conversation about atomic habits two hours ago when I was interviewing Dr. Saba Kidwai. She brought that book up and then she shared what her favorite teaching point or concept was from the book. So I'm going to ask you about that in a minute. But yeah, there are no coincidences how funny it is that uh, out of all the business books there are in the world, we were just talking about atomic habits. The value of disappointment, I feel, is one of the absolute truths in terms of business that everyone th expects everything to go on a linear journey, which of course it doesn't, you know, and most people who have been in business for at least a year or two understand that. And there's more of the, you know, the exponential, the parabolic curve. But when I sort of read that, I went, I don't think it's quite right. And in terms of when people are starting to implement a new project, at least in, you know, a business sense, maybe there's actually often regression. So you actually often go down below the axis before and then uptick afterwards because you're having to break from the norm, there's a whole bunch of opportunity costs from you having to focus on something completely different and you're getting way outside your comfort zone and you're probably, you know, working less efficiently and effectively than you might have been. And you have to go through that journey before you can even get back up to break even before you'd even consider about, you know, moving on to actually, you know, gaining improvement from this new technique, this new approach that you're trying to apply in your life. What would be an example where you have applied your variation on this uh, teaching point in your life or your business and gotten a great result? I use this example within the program itself, but I think it's actually just applies to the program as a whole in terms of the iterative way that we've sort of seen the early approaches of how we've run the program and how we're sort of running it these days. The original version was actually David Jennings running it and it was only three months long and we were trying to squeeze in this content. But over time, um, you know, we were having okay results, but we noticed that, you know, trying to get a business owner to implement something in as little as three months wasn't necessarily that pragmatic. And so we, you know, stretched the content out. So we went to, to move to fortnightly sessions rather than weekly sessions and things like that. And we went through a new version of that. And while we're getting okay results, I don't think it was like in terms of the continuity of results between the different participants, I don't think it was there. And in any type of training program, you'll often have people drop off and you sort of investigate and try and learn why. And I think this was very much through that bottom dip, trying to work out what's working and what's not working for people so we can create a future iteration. And the most recent iteration is where we actually halved the content because we were just going too fast and that approach of you know seeing what's working and what's not and sort of being inquisitive and asking people as i said we've double length of the program since the first iteration we're probably half the content that we tried to squeeze in there and we just go a lot slower and it comes back to like that building of the habit building the muscle type of thing that once they're sort of getting to the uh, the end of their program now it's so much more intrinsic and you can see that the way that they've already started to take it and run with it in terms of trying to implement in different areas of their business. And it's really invigorating to see people who are towards the end of the program and they've actually skipped ahead and they're actually you know, seeking advice on how can they apply it to different areas and things like that. So when you're going through that initial curve, you think everything's broken and everything's wrong and uh, nothing's working for you. And just understanding that it's a process, I think was really, really helpful because otherwise you could just give up partway through before you get back to that break even and think, oh, well, this isn't going to work. I need to do something completely different as opposed to something maybe iteratively different. Yeah. It's progress, not perfection. Yeah. And, and so what would be a thing that sticks out in your mind is like, this is 
really profound or impactful for these business owners to uh, go through this exercise or, or learn this new approach or process? What's something that across the board, it seems like these cohort participants are, are just, they're hitting it out of the park. One of the fundamental things that I learned from Dave Jennings, and I, I don't know if he's got it from somewhere else or whether it's it's one of the core parts of the formula of systemology, but it is that the most important thing is to develop version one of your processes. All too often in business, when you're starting to scale up your business and you're building more team, the go-to thing is to optimize, optimize, optimize. And I'm, I'm as guilty as that of the next person, as the next person. But when you look at what will truly make the difference in a business, so I like to say a difference versus the difference, something that makes the difference is when you can actually build out like the the skeleton of your business with all the bones, with all the arms, with all the legs. And if you were just thinking about how some people go about their business, they might, in terms of a skeleton reference, they might have one really beefy arm that's maybe their marketing department that's working for them quite well. But the other arm is just a bare skeleton without any skin on it and a leg might be missing and things like that because they're just, they've got some parts of their business working really, really well and dialed in. And other elements that maybe just aren't their sweet spot and maybe just aren't their passion and they haven't really worked out at least their formula for how they do the basics because it's just not an area of interest for them. So they're probably still focused on, you know, one thing that's really working well and this other area just, I guess, gets left, uh, left left by the wayside. And by them not just at least working out what their baseline is in terms of getting just that version one of how they do things, it means that the team are usually just left to their own devices and everything's made up as they go. And the problem with that is lots of things don't need to be made up as you go because you've got, you know, once you've been established in business for a while and you work out your routine and how you work with certain types of people and certain customers, then, you know, you might have two, three, five, eight different ways of working with a type of customer. But when you don't have that baseline, it may as well be a thousand different ways because you haven't worked out, you know, what are the common threads. And so missing that version one means that nothing really ever truly sticks in business. So let me give you a hypothetical, in quotes, example. So I've got that that beefy arm with marketing. I do a pretty good job, if I do say so myself, with my own personal brand and with uh, the agency, uh, the SEO agency's brand. But the like missing leg or the the, the little skeletal <laughs> arm is financial controls. So I don't really love looking at profit and loss and balance sheet and financial projections, cash flow, all that. So I don't, and that's not very good. That's like a, a version zero, uh, that no process. So there, there, there's a completely missing limb there. So I'm, I'm curious to, if you're my uh, coach here <laughs> advising me how to, I don't know, heal that trauma or whatever it is that's preventing me from looking at spreadsheets and, and taking some actions in regards to financial controls and setting some processes up. I mean, we, we do have an accounting software that we have a bookkeeper who manages the invoicing and the paying the bills and the contractors and staff and all that. It's all, that's all handled, but I'm blissfully ignorant and I know that's not very responsible of me. So, uh, fix me. (laughs) Because you've got a really good marketing engine in your business. I assume that the analytical side is something that you enjoy and enjoy looking at. Is that right? In some ways, I don't love going into Google analytics. So I don't, uh, but Google Search Console, I use that all the time. I, I use Ahrefs and SEMrush and Moz and the Spark Tor. I'm a power user of these different tools. So if you think about how you've got the you've got that up your sleeve in terms of the way that you use those different tools to assess how things are working, what's working and what's not working in uh, your marketing uh, side of things, your business, going down the same path for the financial side of things for your business would be great as well. If you think about something like traction that I mentioned earlier, I love how traction simplifies things down to a scorecard. And it's very much the same in systemology is what are the different things that if you were to simply assign a very basic number to them, you could 
assess that against like what your budgeted number is against each month and bring it into a scorecard type of view, something probably similar to what you'd use with your marketing um, department, such that you at least rather than having to look at profit loss and balance sheets and things like that, you just simplify it down to a really core set of numbers. I mean, you're probably familiar with things like profit first. Profit first is you know heavily aligned with things like systemology because profit first is a system. It is a system for how you do good financial control to make sure that you know a business owner is extracting profit from the business you know, religiously over time. And so- by, by the way, I did have Mike Michalowicz on my other podcast, which is pretty cool. He is awesome. <laughs> yeah, and I love his book, Profit First. I actually read it, or I listened to it. It was an awesome listen. He's so funny and he just goes off script so much in his audio book. It's, uh, it's awesome. Yeah. And I must admit his book, uh, Fix This Next, I haven't read it, but I saw him present on it at a conference and that was his hierarchy of need for a business. If you haven't looked at it, it's really worthwhile watching um, or, or reading and understanding what's needed at different stages of the business. But in terms of the, how you could get control of the finances the thing is if you don't like it, or if you even suck at it, understanding, you know, the whole, um, the whole is it um, Dan Sullivan, the who, not how, taking that approach, inviting someone that is a trusted consultant, come in and just sort that area of the business out um, to help you get what those version one systems are. Because if there's no, like if there's version zero, right, just to get what that version one might look like. And it doesn't need to be complete you know, and like the full gamut in terms of like every single element to do with your financial control. If you just spoke with someone who was, you know, an expert in that area and got what's the top five things I should be paying attention to for my type of business and, you know, to work out what some budgeting type of figure should be and just bring it back to the simplicity of a couple of numbers that you need to monitor each month. Yeah. Yeah. Because perfect is the enemy of done. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's probably some childhood trauma or something <laughs> tied into this. I haven't figured that out yet. Money mindset. I thought that my money mindset was okay. And I, a, a good friend is actually a profit first professional. Hence why I sort of quite sort of, you know, close in terms of that, uh, that frame of mind with them. And I was talking like a, the whole very slippery slope for anyone in the consulting space is time for money and trying to avoid getting commoditized into time for money. And he was just basically saying, you've got a terrible money mindset and you need to work on that. So yeah, money mindset is very much, very much at the core of a lot of that type of stuff. Yeah. So speaking of childhood, you you alluded to this a little earlier about how you learned thing about your, you being a resolute leader, it ties into your childhood. It was in the book and it was many, many years ago, probably a good decade ago since I read the book. It's talks about the ways that you probably were when you were a child. And I've done a few things over time, just different personal development programs and things like that. And one of the core things that has come up over and over again, and I, I know it stemmed from different elements of my childhood, is the need to know why. And I now understand that, you know, I'm in my 40s now, and I now have a real appreciation for the fact that the need to know why has been a huge strong suit of mine that I could you know, used to create advantage for myself um, in my business and my life. However, it has also been one of the probably singular biggest barriers for me to move fast. So a huge strength in many areas, uh, strength in many areas because it gives me this beautiful depth of understanding of things and understanding, you know, how everything sort of piece, gets pieced together. But on the flip side, if you have a huge need to know why, like I've had, and you've got a team, it can often look a lot like micromanaging or you're not really truly trusting your team because you're inquisitive about how they're doing things because of your need to know why. That's not their problem, it's your problem. And so knowing when to lean into it and knowing when to not lean in and go, no, no, I don't need to know why. Learning to differentiate between those two opportunities has been huge in terms of me understanding how to manage that skill set better. You might get misconstrued with that need to know why as having a fixed mindset. Mm, mm. Just thinking, you know, like, like that, that could look like a fixed mindset. Like, uh, he's really slow to move. He's not making decisions here. He keeps grilling me on like needing to know more and more information. It feels kind of I don't know, stuck in his old, in his ways, you know, <laughs> it's just, you know, may, maybe that's something to, to look at. I don't know. 
Are you familiar with Carol Dweck? Um, I think she was a an academic in the 1960s. I learned about what actually creates a growth mindset from a guy called James Kostrichen. Uh, James Kostrichen is hold, holds a couple of world records. He kayaked with his bet um with his best mate from Australia to New Zealand, which I think took him a bit over a bit over two months. And not long after, then hiked from the edge of Antarctica to the centre and back again. Both of those um, trips were unassisted and that last one took him three months. He knows a thing or two about growth mindset and he simplified it down to a very simple triangle, which is your focus, your physiology and your language. And it was, he was beautifully able to articulate how these related to him, for example, in that kayaking trip. They were talking about focus and they had a couple of opportunities when they were out in the middle of the ocean, halfway between both countries, that people would come near them and offer them assistance in terms of extra food and things like that. Now, their focus was to do that trip unassisted. And so because they were both very resolved on that we're going to do this unassisted, it was very easy for them to say, no, no, don't come near us. Like we're, we, we're doing this unassisted, thank you. Because even rafting up next to the boat could be perceived as, you know, getting assistance. And so being really clear on what you're focused on is at the core of it. And then he was talking about his physiology. He said there's, and I, I know nothing about this, but in terms of kayaking, there's a technique about having low shoulders. And he said that whenever things were going bad, they would discover you know they'd noticed that they didn't apply this approach that they weren't having low shoulders so they were being less effective and efficient in their paddling and things like that and the other one was the language is that when they were getting tired because they were paddling 16 hours a day plus he said that they'd start getting narky at each other they'd start making sort of off the cuff comments and being a little bit mean to each other and things like that and so because they understood that considering what that uh, effort was like he still stands behind the fact it was 99% preparation for both trips, which is really saying something considering what the execution was like. And he said, getting a really firm grasp on this growth mindset from Carol Dweck's work and understanding how to make sure that we maintain our focus, that we maintain our language and we maintain our physiology, that those are really core elements to how they had a successful journey. And I found that really super applicable in the... I've got kids, I've got a seven and a nine year old, you know, when my nine year old sort of uh, loses a basketball game or something like that, it's like just getting him to focus on, you know, stop, you know, let's use language like this rather than language like that. And it's super, super helpful in a variety of different areas of life. Mm. So if you were to apply, let's say what you learned about language and all this to, let's say my situation <laughs> that we just discussed, or I, I just kind of wing it in terms of the financial controls of the business. What would that look like with those with that triangle? Honestly, I'm not sure how physiology would apply to how you're dealing with your money. But if you were to think about your focus, we're talking about you know money mindset and things like that, and it might relate back to something from childhood. Inserting a focus that works for you, you know, inserting a focus of, and it'll probably have some very structured language around it and maybe that's like that i'm going to be profitable and, and achieve financial freedom I, I don't know what it might be but i'm very big on smart objectives you know specific measurable achievable and relevant time framed so make sure it has those type of elements around it just to lock down the focus side of things and then it will probably be a whole bunch of changing your language around the finances because I mean, I'm a little bit that way, not quite maybe so far, like the pendulum hasn't swung quite that far in terms of where you're at um, with your feel and your vibe around the sort of the financial side of things. But I I'm, I'm, would be sure if, uh, if you were to ask people in your life, if you were to talk about money, that you maybe have got a lot of negativity in the language that you use and that just sort of just self-reinforces to yourself that you know, that existing state of mind. Yeah, I don't know that I'm negative about it. I just kind of wing it. I don't have any sense for what is the most expensive tool or resource in the business. I, I, I don't know which clients are most profitable and which ones are not profitable. That's kind of dangerous, <laughs> a little irresponsible. But you, you mentioned something about physiology. You don't know if that's applicable. What just popped in my mind is if I do something small but meaningful in this area of uh, setting up financial controls and some accountability and, and more oversight and insight into what's going on. And I just do it on a high when I'm really in a good mood, or let's say I've just uh, come back from the gym, I've got the endorphins going or something. You know, if I, if I carve out times in the day or during the week where 
it's almost guaranteed that I'm going to be in a really good place physiologically, like after a gym workout. That could be a way to kind of hack the system. Absolutely. Look, using what you're already doing in life to take advantage of those moments when you are primed. And uh, look, I'm a big fan of the approach of, you know, eating the frog. Yeah, Brian Tracing. Right, I love his book, Eat That Frog. <laughs> yeah. But it doesn't always work. You, like you said, I think that's a great example of paying attention to what your physiology is like at those times when you can take on things that maybe you don't really enjoy so much so that you are suitably primed such that you do have that, you know, the existing enthusiasm so you can just smash through it and get it done. And even doing that over time could well change that mindset that, oh, this isn't so bad. I'm actually, you know, enjoying it. Oh, I found this out today. I, I can leverage that in my marketing and link it back to other things that are, you value more in terms of your business and your life. I don't know if you were thinking you, you'd be talking about personal development stuff and <laughs> in a marketing podcast, but here we are. <laughs> Well, it's I'm I'm a huge fan of the, the concept that a, a business only grows as fast as its business owner. And it's what I've seen time and time and time again with different people I've worked with over the years. Some of my very earlier clients, some of them are doing amazingly well and I'm super, super proud of where they've achieved. And some of them have been just held back in different areas. But, you know, it's not like I was, you know, pivotal to the success of some of the earlier companies that I worked with because they were really well established and successful before I even sort of uh, met them. But I can see that with some of these businesses that there's just elements of how they are in their day, how they are in their life, that's it's only one small factor but it's really, really obvious that it holds them back. And it can often come down to things like relationships and mindset, you know, whether it be relationship with team, relationship with people in their life, maybe relationship with money and things like that. And, you know, if it's that, let's say they've always envisaged that they're going to retire at 60 and that they have to work hard, things like that, that's a really, really hard mindset to shift to say, well, you don't need to retire at 60. Maybe you can retire at 50. But when I talk with people about, you know, trying to stop working so much in their business. And I ask them, what's a, a challenging but achievable duration of time from today for you to get out of the day-to-day -day of your business? And quite often I'll work with people that would say probably six to 12 months. I mean, that's pretty cool, right? Uh, lots of effort, but if you're fixed on it, like I'm really focused on getting that as a result, that it's probably achievable within that sort of 12 month time frame. Other people I've spoken to have said 15 to 20 years. There's a lot going on there for someone to say, for me to be able to step back from the day to day, it will take 15 to 20 years of constant effort to, to get that as a result. So that personal development is a super common thread that I see a lot that is really a catalyst for change within people's businesses is once they get that result. And I was actually talking with a, a sort of a, a partner yesterday and he, he runs a coach, a coaching company for specifically for builders. And in terms of where people are going, we, we were looking at his client avatar and he realized that the people that he enjoys working with the most, the people who really latch on to the things that he imparts and they run with it and apply it are actually people who have gone through a catalytic event uh, recently in their life, particularly around personal relationships, who there's something's happened, they've sort of drawn a line in the sand and gone, I can't do that anymore. I need to do different. And that's enough of a catalyst for them to change their mindset, be open to new ideas, to be able to move forward in a different way. You know, the quote that came to my mind when you're talking about like the six months versus the 20 years, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. You know, Henry Ford. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So you've done some personal development seminars and courses and things like that, or what's something that sticks out for you that you did that was profound in terms of personal development? It was probably the, the first thing I ever did that probably started me on that journey was uh, maybe 10, 15 years, probably close to 15 years ago. I did something called the Landmark Forum. And I, I Googled a lot about it, but the thing is I had my graphic designer at the time who is also a you know, reasonably good friend. Over the last six months, I'd seen a really dramatic change in the way that he did stuff. He was, I guess, you know, I won't try to tar everyone with the same brush, but he was a bit of a typical graphic designer that he was an amazing designer, but the way that he ran his business was terrible. I wouldn't get an invoice for maybe, you know, six or 12 months and then I'd get 10 or 15 at a time. If I said, oh, can I go get, can I 
grab this original file because I need to do this with this signage or whatever it might be. He'd be going through hard drive after hard drive and trying to find stuff. So he just wasn't very organizationally minded. And then within a six month window, he just became accountable. He even apologized when he dropped the ball. And that was not the way he typically did stuff. He, he didn't really hold himself to account and he held himself to account. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is not like him. And it, it was great. Cause it just changed the type of conversation we could have and be like, you know, be a little bit more pragmatic with each other and things like that. And anyway, I went and did this program and I, it's, it does talk a lot about, it sort of blends a whole bunch of stuff from things like Dale Carnegie, even Scientology and different religions and Buddhisms. And it basically is a bit of a melting pot. And, you know, although a lot of people have got some bad opinions about it, I, I got some really, really great value for myself in my life. And this is going to sound fairly bold, but it was what made the difference in me being a single guy to now being married with kids, because I had a lot of a mindset about, you know, my past with how my parents were in their relationship, because they divorced when I was, you know, relatively young, but, but at an age that would have been quite impactful for me. And yeah, I, you know, you have these things that the why I was talking about before the need to know why from what I recall it probably actually stemmed from I think it was uh, maybe a week or two after my, my my folks split up and I was about uh, eight or ten or something like that and my mum of a friend came up to me and said you know it's not your fault and I'm like why would I you know I was only young but I'm like why would it be you know it's it's sort of between them but it it actually made me feel a bit dumb because I figured she must be placating me. So therefore there was something that, and, you know, I never thought much of it at the time, but there's a bit of a common thread with all these little things. And that program helped me understand a lot of these things that happened when I was younger that sort of just locked in. And I think by the time I finished that program, I I got a very good understanding of how I could switch on and switch off different things that were attributes of mine. And that's particularly powerful because, you know, as I said, you can lean into knowing the why because it's really good to have this technical understanding. But other times it's like, no, you've got this, you go do that and let me know when you finish, give me a yell if you need help. And being able to just switch back and forth like that was quite pivotal in terms of very much changed the way I ran my team after that point. And I, I'm, I'm sure I became a hell of a lot better boss as well <laughs> as well um, after that point. So I think that's just, that probably just opened my mind up to the fact that, you know, there are other things out there and I need to be a little bit more perceptive. Like I'm a big fan of like, a, there's a, a coach in Australia called Kerwin Ray, and he's got a lot of very, dare I say, alternative perspectives on things. But via listening to one of his podcasts, I listened to an interview with uh, Dr. John Martini, and that blew my mind amongst many other things. Who was a guest on uh, the podcast, by the way. Yeah. And he's just, I mean amazing in terms of the insights and the the, this understanding this depth of understanding about how everything works together in the world and you know humans have this great way of overcomplicating things and hearing uh de martini explain what we actually know you, you know with science what things actually are and how they interrelate i think one of the most profound things was hearing him articulate how a feeling occurs in your brain and then it sort of then you can actually feel it on your skin and he was talking about the different chemical reactions and the electrical pulse um, pulses and this chemical gets released which makes your skin expand or contract it was quite amazing and just listening to that and understanding that there is that depth of knowledge that there are other things that are just outside of what what is let's say commonly known and it's all too common that people try make meaning behind things and say oh i felt this way because of this no you felt that way because there was a chemical reaction in your body and you made it mean this. And I found that really impactful in my life. Yeah, we're meaning makers. <laughs> we just make stuff up. So I'm, I'm curious to hear how you ran your team before going through Landmark and then after. Like, what, what was the big profound shift? I'm trying to think back to some of the instances of with team. It does come centrally back to that need to know why. And that uh, even that resolute leadership, which I probably did that test around a similar time to doing that saying I guess on a journey of personal development and in terms of when I hired people in the early days I intentionally didn't hire A players and I don't necessarily know why but when I was recruiting I would recruit people that I thought were had the appropriate skill level for their role but not hire and I don't know whether it was because I didn't want to be challenged by other people in terms of different ideas or whether I wanted to make sure I just 
plugged that hole in business to make sure that it was set and forget and I could go focus on other things as opposed to having to worry about people wanting to be challenged more and to come up through the ranks in the business. But that was a very common theme for how I ran the business in the earlier days. Whereas in the latter years, with the, it was a motel that I was running and I was often actually hiring university students who were probably in their first year of university. And I would recruit them very much at that age, you're, you know, you, you're hiring for attitude, training for skill, which is, that's not particularly new these days. But the, I guess the relationship uh, that I end up having with those people is that I will impart anything and everything I can to you that is relevant to the job and beyond and using that as the incentive for them to, to do better work. And the way that we had this collaborative approach, I guess I'd say to, to them working for me, one of the, I guess the more senior people that was working through with me for a number of years, he would be asking me questions about stuff that would had no relationship to his job. It was just about business in general, but that was the agreement we had that was, I would spend the time imparting that knowledge to him. So I commit to him fully in terms of that side of things. And he would commit to the business that he would go above and beyond. And it was just this great mutual, I hate using the word synergy, but it was a great synergy for how we would work together such that it was a, it was a triple win. There was a win for me. There was a win for the business and there was a win for him as well. It always created uh, like the exit surveys that I had from people who came through the business in that era. Let's say it probably would have been very different from the early exit surveys because I didn't exit survey back in the original days, probably because I, I knew I didn't want to see it. But I think that approach to running the business was just dramatically different in the way I built my team. And I'm sure that also bred a lot of loyalty uh, amongst your, your team members. Absolutely. When, uh, when COVID happened and COVID for an accommodation business was, it kicked in just in the beginning of our peak season in Australia. And yeah, it was, it just completely turned the business off. That's probably about the, like it saying it was wiped out was one thing, but it basically just, it stopped dead in the tracks and having people say, cause we were having, you know, one or maybe two customers stay a night versus it was a, you know, mid-size, a mid-size business and only having one or two people stay. It's like, there wasn't even any need for anything. And when things started to just dribble through and pick up a little bit, I had a team working from home, sitting in their bed with their laptop on their knees, with their earphones on running the reception of the business from their bed, because that was what they could do at the time and seeing everyone rally together like that and do whatever they need to do to be able to sort of help out. There was a stage that there'll be to have some government support come through later on, but had people offering to work for free because they just wanted to help out. And that was, you know, really moving. And some of this was for people that was, had only been with us maybe six months and they're like, we just want to help out. We just want to sort of help you get through. And you know, that was, yeah, really touching. And so how does that way of being in business a jive or not jive with the old adage, hire slow, fire fast. I hire, I don't even fire fast anymore. I don't actually believe in the fire fast at all. Going back to one of the examples, two of the people, two of the individuals that came through the business when I was really leaning into that approach to running the business, myself and my assistant manager, we agreed on that we're going to pick this individual. She was 19 years old. She was starting a law degree. After a couple of months, he came to me and goes, she's not getting it. She's not, not getting it. We just need to get rid of her. And I'm like, I basically reminded him about why we hired her. You know, there were these different attributes that we saw that she would, um, you know, she was speaking up and she was able to articulate things clearly. I said, you need to change your training style to adapt to her, her learning style. You can't expect her to adapt her learning style to your training style. About a week and a half later, he came to me and goes, oh my gosh, she gets it every time now. We do this, she gets it. She's picking things up so fast. She's picking things up faster than anyone else ever trained before now, just because he was able to, uh, you know, alter the way that he communicated information and maybe gave her the opportunity. Like some people like to write things down. Some people just like to hear it and that's okay. You know, there's oral, oral and kinesthetic type of learners. And, you know, I remember, <laughs> I remember, I think it was probably my year five science teacher insisted everyone wrote everything down that she said. And it was a very slow lesson because she was obviously that style, the kinesthetic style that she you know, had to write things down. But that only works for that type of learner because some people would say that she was a great teacher because, you know, she made sure you do this. And for me, I was a bit more of an oral or a kinesthetic learner. It just didn't, it just didn't work for me. And so when with the team, they were able to sort of adapt and 
apply these new approaches, it meant that I guess I don't really hire, I do hire slowly, but I don't really fire fast because when like I've got an assistant at the moment who may even watch this later on, but you know, she's quite new to business. She's only worked in family businesses before. So this is really her first proper real world job. And I know that. And so it is my responsibility. I, I, I hired her for some attributes that were very, very intrinsic and you, you couldn't really fake in an interview. And so I hired her knowing that she didn't have that experience. And so that's on my shoulders that I hired someone with those type of attributes and a, a lack of skill in that area, knowing that it's going to be a journey to go through. And it's on my shoulders to be responsible for making sure that she gets what she needs in the guidance. I'm, I'm curious, what were the attributes that really stuck out for you? Like, okay, she's a must hire. One of the main things that came up was when I was asking her about how the learnings from working in two family businesses that she'd bring to, um, towards working in any business in the future. When I asked that question the first time, I garbled the question because I changed partway through. And she said, sorry, can you ask that again a different way? Which is, uh, for context, you know, I'm double her age. She's from an Asian background and I'm from, you know, a, you know, a, a white guy and she's from a sort of, um, you know, a developing country. And so there's a lot of power differential. And so for someone to have the confidence to say, hey, I'm not quite sure, rather than trying to fake and make up the question, that was like quite good. When I correctly sort of asked the question and I was concise with the, the question, she said, oh, I'm not really sure how to say it, but it's to invest, you know, that when you're running a business, that the things that you do today are making a benefit in a year or two's time. And so that if you just focus on what's going to work for you in the short term, you're going to like miss out for what you need to be doing to impact the long term. And for me, for I mean, she's in her early 20s, for her to have that foresight, it's like, yeah, okay, she's she sees the forest from the trees. Mm -hmm. Well, that's awesome. Very cool. So I know we're running out of time here. So I, I'm, I'm going to end this with a, a very strange question that uh, I don't normally ask. It's certainly, certainly not on a marketing show, but I'm, I don't know. I feel, I feel like I'm being nudged to do so. What was your darkest day and how did that shape you into the person you are today? I think it's probably quite recent. It was having to fire pretty much all 15 team members from the motel, that business in COVID. And because we we really planned how we were going to get through and the structure we were going to take and how we were going to, you know, distribute it workloads and things like that. And it just obviously changed so rapidly. And having to I had to let go of people who'd been there for two decades and I hadn't even been there that long. And but also people who had only been with me six months that I knew were this fresh new blood that were the the new iteration of the business that I knew were going to be with me for another three, five years and take it into places that I didn't even know where I was going to go. And that whole lack of the business basically dying for a period of time and that completely resetting how I was going to be doing what I was going to be doing for the next year or two because I was playing in the consulting space, but I wasn't really building my business. I was still sort of balancing myself between the two areas. So doing that and following in my own self-pity for a while uh, during the sort of the depths of COVID going, what am I going to do? But basically when things started to come back, I realized that I really actually needed to commit to what I was doing and that I rebuilt that the, the business in a, the motel business in a, in a different way. We sort of changed the way that we were staffing the business, but I also went really gun ho into my consulting business. I think it also dramatically recalibrated how I wanted to spend my time in my life. I think, you know, COVID was a great opportunity to see where we're spending our time and make sure that, you know, we're really doing things that, that fill our bucket. And, you know, I, I taught my daughter to ride her, ride her bike during COVID and things like that. And switching gears, when life started to return to normal, I didn't want to lose that. I didn't want to lose that ability to have time and things like that. So I now work from home. I probably could have always worked from home, but now I do it by choice. And I think going through that crisis and going through that super low period of time, it just really, I thought I was resilient before, but I have a whole new caliber of resilience these days. Mm. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing and just being so uh, open about all this. So if our listener wants to work with you and learn from you, all that, where do we send them? 
probably to my website, BizTech Guru would be the easiest way, but I'm very, uh, very visible, let's say in the systemology world as well. And, uh, you know, I generally work with people as long as they're in a, a, a similar to Australian time zone, that's okay. But that would probably be the best way. Awesome. All right. Well, this was fantastic and, uh, you're an inspiring guy. So thank you for, uh, for coming on the show and for sharing your wisdom and your experience with us. You're welcome. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. And thank you, listener. Now get out there, make it a better world, and we'll catch you in the next episode. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.